the obligation of the study of Torah is not only when you're in a, a state of tranquility, not distracted, even if it takes a special level of effort to focus, to study Torah, even that you have the obligation. The obligation is b'shoch v'chom. It says, the bartabam b'shikru v'esecha, when you're dwelling in your home, you're in your home, all distraction is, is filtered out. What about when you're traveling? You have to study Torah, still. This is referring to not only Torah, Kriya Shema. You just have to say Kriya Shema when you go to bed, nighttime period, when people are rising. Many years ago, there was a person, his name was Rav Chaim Shmuel Evitz, of blessed memory. He was the Mirror Rosh Hashiva in Israel. And um, he was married to the daughter of Eliezer Yehuda Finkel, which was the son of the altar, who was the original Rosh Hashiva in Europe of the Mir. And he became the Rosh Hashiva in, in Israel. When the Mir moved to Israel, he was the head of the yeshiva. And he was a phenomenal, insightful type of person. And he speaks to the boys before they were going on vacation. And we talk about intercession. So he says, when you go on intercession, of course, you have to, when you're studying yeshiva, you sleep less. So now you have to sleep more to regain your energy. You have to eat differently when you're home to regain your energy. You have to relax because here you're involved in this very intense schedule. So you do things which give you that level of relaxation, but you can't just stop studying. It's intersection. No classes, you don't open a book. Why not? So he explains, the Torah tells us, the Torah is your life and the length of your days. Person says, you know something? I've been working so hard. I'm going to take off a week. I'm going to take a break from life. I'm not going to breathe for the next week. You can't take a break from life. You could be less pressured, less intensely involved, but to cut off the flow of oxygen, or to put a tourniquet where the blood can't flow through the, that, that limb, you know what happens. Just a question of time. Quickly, you don't continue. Torah itself is but it's so difficult. I'm traveling. Do you breathe when you travel? Do you function when you travel? This is part of your functionality. When you lie, when you sleep, and when you rise, there's already the Shema. The Ramchal writes in the Derech Hashem, the way of God, that it's interesting. At nighttime, what is the extended period of Shema of night? From nightfall till dawn. You have quite a bit of time to say the Shema. The morning Shema, it's from when people, time people rise, and when the majority of people finish rising, you can no longer say the Shema. It's only at the very beginning of the day. First, only for three hours. After three hours pass, you've expired the time, you can no longer say Shema. I mean, you could say it, but you're not accredited for Shema, for accepting the yoke of heaven upon yourself. Why? She so explains that what is the nighttime period? Night always has a certain ominous connotation. At nighttime, it's a time of impurity. 
the nether forces reign the world at nighttime. This is the counterbalance to holiness, to spirituality. Because everything in existence has to have, there has to be a balance. If there's no balance, if there's only good, a person naturally does good. There has to be an alternative. The alternative is doing the wrong thing. But what, what causes, what draws you to that? That's the nether forces. The nether forces are detrimental to a person's life and spirituality. So when did the nether forces have reign of the world? When man retires to his, the protection of his home, so out there, outside of the residence of person where it's, it's considered unprotected, that's where the nether forces are. When day comes, since it's man's function is to go out during the day, God cleanses the world of the nether forces. He does his house cleaning. It's like a wind coming in and blowing out the smog and the fog and all the impurities. It's like the rate air quality. That air quality is within normal levels. Other day, because there's no circulation of air, it's unhealthy levels. People with respiratory issues should not go outside. Okay? But it's based on, because it has been clean, cleansed. Every morning at sunrise, the light rises, the sun Light it has a very positive connotation. God himself is now re-energizing existence, re-infusing it with all that's necessary to empower the positive forces to be able to function and provide a sufficient level of attraction that people should do the right thing. They should not go south, let them go north. When God initially activates those forces, that's at sunrise. Right at that moment, we acknowledge God as he's, it's his dominion. He's the almighty. He is the uh, omnipotent one. He's the only one. So at that moment, it's like when a king is coronated, right away, what do you do? You acknowledge it. You announce it. The morning is the beginning of that. The nighttime period, the Kriyashma is what is not to announce God's coming or God's infusion, but rather to be protected from what you're exposed to during that 12 hour period, the nighttime period. That's what it's about. You know what I mean? It's to expose to these nether forces, which are detrimental to every aspect of our, of our spirituality. So we say the Shema to bring some Kedusha to the world despite the fact that this is a moment that this is the domain of the nether forces, which is the nighttime period. That's the understanding. So the nighttime, continuously, any time is the appropriate time to say the Shema. Because it's a time of the nether forces. During the daytime, where those nether forces are cleansed from the world, we have to acknowledge what it's all about. Why do we exist? What's the objective of creation? God's glory, more of God's glory, and more and more of God's glory. That, that's, the, that's the value of the daytime. Therefore, it's only when you actually, it begins, the first three hours when people are rising, which people become functional when they rise, that's when you declare and you announce your belief in God that he is the monotheistic be being. And everything that exists is only because he wills its existence. Now we speak about bits of filling. tom los al yodecho. You tie them as a sign on your arm. Arm means the upper part of the arm, between the shoulder and the elbow. That's where you put the filling. And it should be frontlets between your eyes. This is the filling of Rosh. You wear the filling up to the hairline. Zuzus Pesach means up to the hairline, not beyond the hairline. It can't be pulled too far back, and it can't be pulled too far forward. It has to be located in, in its correct location. 
So this is the mitzvah of tefillin. That when you say Krishma, you should be wearing tefillin. And the Gemara tells us, the Talmud tells us, that a person says Krishma without tefillin, and he's able to wear tefillin, it's as if he offered false testimony. He was saying you should tie this a sign on your hand, a front that's between your eyes. <coughs> and that's the correct attire to accept the yoke of heaven. Where is it? Where did it fill in? <coughs> so it's, he's saying something's like being two faced. You're saying it, but you don't mean it. Because if you have to fill it, why don't you put on the fill in? Perhaps this doesn't have to. <coughs> and the first can bring the fill in. An hour after the time of Krishna expires. Of course, you say Krishna without filling. Because you're doing your best. It's not an indication that you don't believe and that's your identity. It's your identity. <coughs> but you don't have the items to identify with what you're saying. <coughs> What exactly are the tefillin? What's the value? So it says explicitly, a sign on your arms and frontlets between your eyes, meaning corresponding to your eyes, but not beyond the hairline. That's we we fill in. But these boxes, they contain within certain portions, certain portions of the Torah on parchments. And you have to meet all the criteria which God sets in place, of how they're written, the order which you place them, and exactly the color of the film that they're black. You have the shin, which is part of the, one of the names, unpronounced names of God, Shakai, on each side of the tillin of the Rosh. And you wrap it in a certain way, and the knot has to be made a, a certain type of knot, which looks like a yud, which is the yud of Shakai. And if you do that, that is the insignia. That's the sign of your arm, and that's the front that's between your head, between your eyes. We know the heart is the emotion. The mind is the brain. That's the intellect. As I mentioned to you, when you put on the tefillin, on your arm, which corresponds to the heart, you're supposed to think, first, I'm fulfilling the mitzvah tefillin, as God wants me to fulfill the mitzvah tefillin. In addition, you think that all the emotion of my heart, all the feeling, is dedica dedicated to the will of God. In addition, you think, I'm only quoting the Shulchan Aruch, the code of laws, the words of the of Rav Yosef Karo, you must think that God took you out of Egypt. The first of the Ten Commandments, what did God say? I am your God, your Lord, who took you out of Egypt. So you're supposed to think, the tefillin, what did the parchment say? I took you out of Egypt. I am your God. As a result of that, when you put on the tefillin on your arm, you're dedicating your heart, which is your emotion, your feeling, to God and which God who took you out of Egypt. That's what you're supposed to think. When you have that thought process, the tefillin and the emotion, they mesh. It's not because your emotion now is connected to that. Even when you take off the tefillin, you've already been touched. Your emotion has been sanctified because that was your request. When you put on the tefillin which, which of the hand, which corresponds to the heart. When you put it on your head, top of your head, which is the brain, which is the intellect, which is the whole neurological system, which is dependent on the brain, I'm dedicated my mind, my intellect, all my understanding to God. Again, so it's not only you're identifying wearing the correct attire, which is the sign on the arm and the frontlets between the eyes, you're actually infusing it with an intent. It's causing a meshing of the intellect and what the tefillin represent. 
So you're spiritualizing the mind. The mind now takes on a spiritual connotation. And that we see from the Shema. Then it concludes. And you should write these paragraphs on the doorposts of your homes and of your courtyards, the gates of your courtyards. This is a Torah obligation. Your residents must need have a mezuzah. That's a Torah obligation. It's based on this, the last words in the first paragraph of the Shema. Medjish tells us something very interesting. Normally, if you have a palace of the king, you have centuries standing at the entrance of all the entrances to the palace, protecting those entrances, that no foreign element should go through those doors to protect the king. Here, Hashem says to us, put the mezuzahs on the door, and I will stand at the door and protect your home that you should not be harmed. It goes the other way. The king is protecting us that if you fulfill the mitzvah of putting the mezuzah on the door, we don't put the mezuzah on, on the doorpost to, to merit protection. You put it on your doorpost for the same reason why you're with villain, for the same reason why we keep Shabbos and dietary laws, because God said so. But God is just telling you, if you do that, I will stand God at your doorpost and not allow any foreign element to come through your doorpost. But it's not reward. It's just the reality. The reward for mezuzah, that's something which we see for the world to come. It's interesting. On Shabbos, we don't wait fill Why don't we, or on Yom Tif, we don't wait fill Because Shabbos itself is considered an os. We say in the Shom Neshaz Shabbos, we say, Osi Beni Venechem. It's a sign of distinction between us and God. So because we have that sign, we don't wear the sign, which is the tefillin, which is a sign that we are God's people. Because I said it's the equivalent of an insignia. Now, if a Naju wears tefillin, he's not in violation of anything. It's not appropriate, but he's not a violation. But if a Naju observes Shabbos, he's subject to the death penalty. Because since Shabbos is an oath, is a sign, a sign of the distinction, how God has the differentiate between the Jewish people and nations of the world, this person is observing the Shabbos, he's assuming something which he has no right to. And therefore, at on a spiritual level, he's deserving of, of death. God only will take him out. So the obvious question is, the tefillin are also a sign of distinction. It's called os. But yet, a non is permitted to wear tefillin. What's the difference between the tefillin although it's a sign, and Shabbos, which is a sign, but for Shabbos, he's liable for the death penalty, and for Tefillin, although it's the same sign, in its place, he's not subject to the death penalty. What's the difference? The Gemara tells us that Shabbos itself is main olam habo, has a semblance of the world to come. What does that mean? What is the world to come? The world to come is having a relationship with God. And based on the level of perfection and advancement which you've made in your life through the challenges of life, the closer you are, the more you can cleave to that source of everything, which is God himself. The closer you are, the greater beneficial you are. If you're less worthy, your arms left, or even beyond that, beyond that, it's not the same. When the Torah speaks about 
It should be a sign on your arms and on your head. What does that mean? Shabbos, if you're having experience, a relation with God. The holiest day of the year is Shabbos. Why is Shabbos the holiest day of the year? Because God descends into existence and we have a relation with God. So he gave the sign that he gave a Shabbos that we're not, we have to refrain from creative activity and declare it and declare that God took us out of Egypt. That's to give us a basis of a worthiness to be able to cleave to God's presence in this existence. That's a relation with God. The non-Jew has no relation with God. Well, since at Sinai he rejected the Torah, which would have been ultimately the connector between God and, and them, the Jews are the only one who embraced it. Therefore, the Shabbos is unique and exclusive for us. So we're talking about cleaving, attaching yourself to God, and as a semblance of the world to come. The non-Jew has no relevance to that. Therefore, it's Chayv Misa. The Tefillin, they're a sign. But it's not, we wear it during the weekday. God's in heaven. It's not, we're being exposed to a semblance of what the world to come is. So there's no reason why not. It's not because it's false identity. He's not trying to deceive the public when he's wearing the tefillin that he's a Jew and he's not a Jew. That's not the reason. The reason is because Shabbos being a sign means only those who are worthy of that relationship. If you go through the front door and have the relationship, that's a sign you're the chosen. And if you're not the chosen and you want to partake of that, then you, then you hear the music. Then the liabilities is the death penalty. Give you an example. Although there's somebody on the Zoom who writes entry letters for people who want to go to Harvard, there's a club called the Harvard Club. And I've been there a number of times because the people who I met with, they themselves were graduates of Harvard, graduate school. So they invited me to come as their guest. I once gave a sheer in the Harvard Club. And also you have the uh, Yale Club. Been there too. Also, Yale graduates, they have a right to entry. Okay. What about if you don't belong there? And you put on your yeah, you put on your Harvard sweatshirt, which you bought at a use a used shop in Greenwich Village. Because one of the guys who died of an overdose in Greenwich Village, they stripped off his sweatshirt and they sold it to this used clothes shop. And you bought it. And you put on that Harvard sweatshirt after, of course, getting it cleaned. And you walk through the doors and you salute, you acknowledge them, they let you in. Now, they, you have to take, they take your fingerprints and they realize you don't belong there. What do they do to you? They says, excuse me, sir, you don't belong here. Could you please leave? And if you don't want to leave, they throw you out on your head. That's what they do. They call the sergeant the bombs. They escort you out. That's exactly what Shabbos is. You want to observe the Shabbos to have a piece of the pie, Lahavdil, where you don't have the means to digest it. You're exposing yourself to something which you have no relevance to. It's almost disgraceful. You're disgracing God. How do you have the audacity to enter into a, a relation with God where you're not that person? Therefore, it's punished by death. When you put on tefillin, it's false identity. I'm happy to identify with God, okay? You have no, a non-Jew has no obligation. Could you hold one moment? To take a break for a second. Therefore, even though Shabbos is quantified as a sign, a sign of distinction, but it's O.C. Beini Uveinechem. It's a sign between me and you. That's a discernment between you and the nation of the world. Only you have that exclusivity of relationship with me, nobody else. Nobody else is welcome. The tefillin is a sign. It's a sign that you're special. But the Beinu Vinechem is not there. Therefore, the, the Naju wearing it, it's false identity. 
but it's not an infringement. It's not trespassing on something that you have no relevance to. Therefore, the liability for that is not the death penalty. But when you're going in an area where you don't belong to benefit from something, which is considered trespassing, then there's serious liability and consequence because it's osi bene uvene chem. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, recording a program.